On behalf of our community here at the Walla Walla University Church, we are delighted that you are joining us today for worship. We invite you to open your hearts to God as we gather to rekindle our hope in our Creator. You can learn more about our church community at our website, www.church.com. We are grateful to the many people and resources that make this broadcast ministry possible. And if you'd like to partner with us in this ministry, you can do so by following our link and donating on our church website. Thank you again for joining us today. Happy Sabbath.
Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross despite the shame, and now he sits at the right hand of God. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Bienvenidos al culto divino de la Iglesia Universitaria. Hoy honramos a nuestro Salvador resucitado, al Redentor y al Amigo. Estamos felices de que estén aquí con nosotros. Mi nombre es Lizzy Zendedich, Jen Ogden, pastor y maestra de esta institución. Welcome to Sabbath worship at the Walla Walla University Church. Today we honor a risen and resurrected redeemer and friend. And we are thrilled that you are here with us. We are Lixi Zemleduch, a professor at the university, and I'm Jen Ogden, pastor here at the University Church. Algunos de ustedes quizás prefieren escuchar el servicio en español. De ser así, les pedimos que vayan atrás. Ahí está la oficina de información. Ustedes pueden pedir auriculares. O si ustedes quieren ser parte del equipo que traduce cada sábado, les invitamos a llamar a la oficina de la iglesia. Some of you may prefer to hear this service in Spanish. We have a translation team that translates every week into Spanish. You can find a headset available for you at the information desk in the lobby. Or if you would like to join the translation team, we invite you to do so. Call the church office and we will make sure you are put in contact with the head of the team, Sandra Graham. Ahora, todos juntos vamos a elevar el nombre de nuestro Dios, cantando el himno 165. Miren, santos, la vista es gloriosa. Let's lift Jesus' name together in song. Sing with us hymn number 165. Look, you saints, the sight is glorious.
Worthy is the Lamb to receive honor, power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and glory, and blessing. Worthy are you, Jesus, Lord of our life. Amen. Please be seated. It is my privilege to invite the children forward for a story on this glorious Easter Sabbath. And we have a wonderful storyteller, Mrs. Marcy Knopf, who is going to wow us. I hear some great things are in the works. Now, it is our tradition as the children come forward for children's story that there are monies handed to them. And this offering goes to our local church budget, which furthers ministry here at this local church. So children, as you're coming forward, make sure you're looking for those. And for those of you who are going to remain in the pews, we invite you to sing a song as the kids come down. He lives. Sing with us.
morning, boys and girls. Do you know the song, I have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart? Have you heard that song? Oh, that is one of my favorite. And do you know what? Joy is a feeling that we get, and it is deep down in our hearts. That's where it lives, and that's where it grows. I think joy is better than happiness. When we have the joy of Jesus in our hearts, it doesn't want to stay there, does it? It wants to bubble right out of our hearts, and it wants to overflow onto everyone around us. Can I show you? When we have the love of Jesus in our hearts, it wants to overflow all around us. Now, joy is special. Joy wants to be shared with other people. So I feel joy when I help somebody, when I surprise them, when I make something for them and I see how happy it makes them, I feel joy. But I also feel joy when I get something from somebody else. When I get a card or a letter that somebody wrote me and put in the mail, oh, I feel joy then too. But do you know what? I think the purest joy comes from being with God. And I have a story today that I want to tell you about God and some joy that I felt. Oh, it was a busy day. It was a Friday. It was about two years ago, and it was springtime, a little bit earlier, and I had been busy. Oh, I'd been running all over the place. My job was so busy. I had to still go buy groceries, and I had to unpack them, and I had to do the dishes, and I still wanted to vacuum. <sighs> do your parents ever get like that sometimes on a Friday evening? They have so much they want to get done, and there's just not quite enough time to get it all done. Well, that's where I was. I had just pulled under my carport. My car was full of groceries. I started hauling them in. It was raining. It was kind of a yucky afternoon. It was going to be dark soon. I got into the kitchen, and I stopped. Sometimes... Sometimes, not often enough, I wish it was more, but sometimes I hear God talking really quietly in my head. And he said, stop, come outside and see my majesty. And I stopped and I said, what? I've got to get this done, Lord. I've got, the, I've got to go still get the groceries in. I've got to make dinner. I still want to vacuum the living room. I don't have time. But do you know what? Thankfully, God didn't listen to me. And he said again, this time with more joy and more intensity, he said, no, come on outside. Come outside and see my majesty. So I didn't stop that time. I went right outside onto my back porch. And right after I got out there, there was a break in the clouds. And the sun shone through. And all of a sudden, the mountains behind my house started glowing. And my backyard lit up. It was pinks and oranges. And oh, it was so beautiful. It looked like things were on fire and they were sparkling. And then a rainbow appeared. Not just one rainbow, but two. Have you ever seen the perfect, the two rainbows? Oh, double bows. Yes, that's what this was. And they were the most vivid rainbows I've ever seen in my life. And the ends of the rainbow were in my backyard. The grass was a vivid green. The rainbows were right there. And I was in awe. I felt the deepest joy. God had talked to me. And I knew he wanted to share his joy with me. He wanted to share something beautiful with me. And the rainbows were right there. And I just stood there. And I enjoyed it. And I thanked him. But then I heard his voice one more time. He said, wait, there's more. And I thought, how could there be more? This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. My backyard is on fire. There's beautiful rainbows. But my eyes were drawn down to the fence line and standing right by my back fence. Do you know what was standing there? A deer. A deer was standing right by my back fence, and it was looking right at me. And I stood there, and everything was glowing, and the deer was looking right at me. And we just stood there, and oh, I felt the deepest joy I've ever felt. Pretty soon the deer bounded away back to the field, and pretty soon things faded. But that was the most special thing, I think, that's happened to me. God talking and then seeing that amazing, amazing thing he had planned. I felt connected to God. I felt joy. 
And boys and girls, I want to remind you that this is Easter weekend. This is a special time of year. God gave us the most amazing gift. So as you celebrate Easter this weekend, I want you to feel joy, not just a little joy. I want you to feel a lot of joy for God's love. I want it to bubble out of you and bubble over. And I want you to be able to tell other people about God's love too. Can you do that? All right. Happy Sabbath. You can go back to your seats. On this Easter Sabbath, when we celebrate the new life that Jesus brings to us, we want to celebrate a couple of new lives that have joined our ranks recently. Sherrick Hiscock, who is here, uh, has a son named Jared, and Jared and Damie, who live in Lincoln, Nebraska, had a baby boy named Desmond on the 18th. Sherrick, congratulations on being a grandpa. Some of you will remember Jared as he was a student here and sang regularly at the church while he attended. And also, David and Melissa Ray welcomed Aiden Mark Ray on March 26th, and he's adorable. And he is adored by Ethan and Gavin and Haley, his big siblings. So welcome, newbies. We're thrilled you are here. For a long time, we have been praying for our beloved Hope Lino. Last year, as many of you know, she was diagnosed with bone cancer. She's recently turned 16, and this year, this week, was declared cancer-free. So, Hope, I know that you're listening and that you're watching online since you can't be with us right now. And we sent home a birthday present and a thank God you are free from cancer present. So it's on its way with your sister. In other news, our Mary Ann Goltz had a mother who passed away this week. Mary died in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Mary Ann and Tor will be traveling there to lay their final parent to rest. So we have new orphans in our family, and we just ask that you continue to surround Marianne and Tor with your love and grace. And we ask also that you lift Ilo Hutton and her family in your prayers. Ilo's in the hospital with some serious infection, and we just ask that you continue to remember her and her family in your prayers as well. If you are able, would you kneel with me as we pray? Gracious God, gentle nurturer, endless redeemer, what a privilege for us to kneel here together in your presence. We come to the end of this week having seen you alive in our days. We have seen your mercy poured out. Meals have been cooked and shared, visits have been made, hugs given, hands held. You have healed and cared for so many. In this valley this week, through the amazing work of the Love Heals Clinic, you reached out to over 700 people. God, your hand is visible here. 
We thank you for the safe arrival of Aidan Mark and of Desmond. And God, we praise your name for the healing of our beloved Hope. May her 16th year of life be blessed with health and vigor and continued courage. We ask for your grace and care over Ilo in her illness. May you give her family strength, may you give her strength, and may you give us the courage to love them through this rough spot. And we ask also, Lord, for your comfort for the Galtz family as they lay Marianne's mother to rest this week. May the sweet memories of a lifetime together help carry them through this grief. On this Sabbath, we pause to reflect on the day long ago when the flawless Christ, innocent and perfect, was laid in a cold and desolate tomb. He had been beaten, he had been crucified, and he was buried. And in the night, it seemed all hope was gone. But the rulers of this earth could not control him. No, they didn't take his life. Jesus laid his life down. And all the chains of death could never hope to hold him. So in this night, our hope lives on. And we eagerly wait to see the Son of Man descending. And the sword he'll swing is brighter than the dawn. And the gates of hell will never stand against him. So in the night, our hope lives on. Hallelujah and hallelujah. It is in the name of the risen and beloved Savior that our hope lives on. And in his name we pray. Amen. Our scripture today is found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, and I will be reading from the New Living, Test from the New Living Translation. There are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who sows discord in a family.
Social exchange theory is a sociological and psychological theory that studies social behavior between individuals. It looks at the interaction between two parties as, as, as they determine the cost and the risk associated with coming into relationship. And the goal of social exchange theory is that you come out of an exchange with a positive accrual of benefits as opposed to risks. Let's imagine that you have a friend and his name is Bob. Every Tuesday, you go to Starbucks with Bob, and every Tuesday when you go to the till to pay for your drinks, Bob begins to pat his pockets, and he says he's forgotten his wallet for the third week in a row. No problem, Bob. And so when you get home, you Venmo or you cash app Bob so that he can pay you back. Bob never sends you the money. And so you decide and you make a good, I think, judgment that Bob may actually be a freeloader, negative in your social interaction. But the thing about Bob is that if something has an engine, he is a wizard. He can fix it. Just give him a toothpick, a rubber band, and duct tape, and he will have it running. And Bob is also an incredible wingman in any social interaction. And so you look at the risks, you look at the benefits, and you decide, you know what? This relationship is worth my time. Bob continues to say your friend. And all of us have in our life Bobs or Nancys. If you are a Nancy, this is not personal with whom we have to figure out, is the cost of this interaction worth our time? For some of us, those calculations come in our business because we have someone who is part of our portfolio, who although the terms are pretty clear of the relationship, is consistently asking for more discounts than you've already given, consistently complains about the quality of product that you deliver, and although they have a net 30-day agreement, cons consistently pay you five days too late. Negative. But they have been the biggest source of referrals for you in the last two years, allowing to have at least a six-point increase in your bottom line. Positive. And so you keep them as part of your customers. We make these calculations all the time. For those of you who are currently uh, having fun running over the older ones who decided to join intramurals, um, you may have someone on your team who has a rotten attitude, terrible attitude, but he's the top scorer, so he's in the team. You may have someone in your life who causes you untold amounts of stress, an aunt that you don't like visiting because she consistently is asking you when you're going to get married. And you're like, I'm in college trying to figure that out. Hold your horses. But she makes the best apple pie, so you go to her house. <laughs> you are making decisions in this social interaction about the cost and the benefits, and she comes out on top. Or perhaps you have a favorite you pick farm that you go to in the spring. The customer service is awful. They treat you like you're imposing on their time, but the asparagus is divine. So you keep going. You're making decisions about the cost of the interaction. Now, even if we differ on where that line may be between the cost and the associated uh, benefits, none of us people in the balcony would ever enter a relationship in which the terms of that relationship were set up for you to receive shame, scorn, reproach, hostility, violence, and then eventual murder. Nobody would willingly enter a relationship like that. And even if there were some of you who have an altruistic mindset, thinking, well, I think I could uh, 
imagine a time when that might be a possibility, I would say none of us would enter into a relationship like that where we did so with delight and with joy. None of us would do that. The cost would be too great. The cost would be insurmountable. And yet, when we go to the ancient book of Hebrews, chapter 12, as we will be going to this morning, we find this incongruity in an exchange which has been given to us. The author writes, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So for those of you who've grown up in church, you may know that the book of uh, Hebrews is an interesting book which compares and contrasts Jesus Christ with, the, with some Old Testament characters. The book of Hebrews does these comparisons and says Jesus Christ is greater than the angels. He's more superior than the Torah, than Moses, and the covenant, than the promised land. Jesus Christ, in essence, is the MVP. This is what Hebrews is telling us. And then when we get to Hebrews chapter 12, after we have heard that God's word uh, is hope for new creation and that he is our eternal priest and our perfect sacrifice, we come to Hebrews chapter 12 that you can see, and it's the apex of the book of Hebrews. And in this uh, apex, we have what is called a paranetic um, affirmation for the readers. It's essentially giving you moral instructions about how you then ought to live your life and go on the journey with Christ based on what has been told. And the author writes that we ought to lay aside our weights, to run the race with endurance, to accept correction, to not grow weary or bitter in our journey with Christ. And so as we reflect on Hebrews chapter 12 during this Easter season, and if you looked on your bulletin, uh, going through our emotions series on God's emotion of joy, you may be wondering, how do we then come to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, and bring into the same room the words joy and the cross? How do we broach what to me seems a cavernous and insurmountable gap between something as cruel as the cross and something as life-giving as joy? Is there a relationship? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you are aware that the cross originally was not a piece of jewelry as we now have made it. It was not uh, a prompt for the Met Gala for people to stand on the red carpet and to wear crosses and to have pictures taken. It was not about what Rihanna wore with a cross. It's not about what Odell Beckham Jr. has on his ear as he's catching a touchdown. The cross was an implement of torture and cruelty. It was an implement of humiliation. And Romans who specialize in the humiliating torture of the cross actually promised that if you are a Roman citizen, we may kill you, but we won't use the cross because that's just cruel. It was slow execution, and it was not only humiliating, it was agonizing. In fact, the word excruciating comes from this Latin word excruciatus, out of the cross. And so the cross becomes the very definition of pain. How do we tether these two words together? Joy and crucifixion joy and the cross. It seems to me that it's, uh, it's not reconcilable. In fact, when you go to the book of John, chapter 19, verse 29, the incredulity for me deepens because we are told that Jesus, while he's on the cross, is given a sponge of vinegar on a hyssop branch. I don't know if you've ever just stopped to think about that moment during this passion narrative of Jesus on a cross, being given a sponge on the end of a stick to slack his thirst because he's asked for it. Why did they do that? The Romans had absolutely no skin in the game to be nice 
to the people they were executing. None of the soldiers thought they might have been written up and sent to HR for being bad employees if they didn't give water to the criminals on the cross. So why give Jesus any kind of water, any kind of uh, liquid for his thirst when he is on the cross? It seems to me that something is amiss. And as I read it deeper, this seemingly benevolent gesture is actually just a continuation of the cruel farce that they had perpetuated on Jesus Christ. The offer of the sponge is continued psychological torment because the ancients did not have a Walmart to go to to grab a fresh sponge to give to Jesus. In fact, when, archaeolog when archaeologists go to ancient sites, the only place they find sponges on sticks are in public latrines. Nobody would have their own sponge on a stick because it was too expensive. Only the very wealthy would. So you would go to the public latrine, and then the sponge on a stick would be an implement for hygienic cleansing. And this tool is used and dipped in wine vinegar and given to the Son of God as he thirsts on a cross. This is the final taste that Jesus has in his mouth as he gives up his life for humanity. Where is the joy? What motivates Jesus to endure the cross and the shame and the agony? What is Hebrews 12 even talking about? I know, maybe it's because Jesus was looking forward to sitting on the right hand of God. After all, that's what it says, right? Jesus Christ is excited by the potential of going through the cross and going back to heaven and being uh, reunited within this Trinitarian family. Maybe that's why he's excited to endure the cross. I don't think so. That, that does not seem like it's enough for me. It may be a part of it, but Jesus Christ already had it. Why go through the cross just so you can be back with God? At this point, we just, we're going to pause just for a moment. We're going to come back to this question because we are talking about joy. And I do uh, realize even as I prepare this message that there is a sense in which you look in your bulletin and then I stand up and before you know it, we're talking about a sponge on a stick and Jesus on the cross. You're like, where is the joy, Andreas? This is, uh, this is a little dreary. So the Bible does tell us that God has joyful emotions. And we're going to look at some of those, and then we're going to come back to what we started at the beginning. So hold the pin in your mind. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 30 tells us that joy is part of God's character. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence. Verse 31, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. All through the Old Testament, God commands his people to have holy days, to have festivals, to be joyous people, so much so that uh, this amplitude of feast means that by the time we get to the 14th century, we have contracted the word holy days into holidays, uh, recognizing that God is the one who calls us into his, into his goodness and to have joy as people who follow him. Holidays were God's idea because God is joyful. Another verse, uh, Isaiah chapter 62 verse 5 says, as a bridegroom rejoices over his pride, so will your God rejoice over you. And then the last one, Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And I think it's important to see that God is joyous and joyful even in the Old Testament because sometimes we posit a God who got converted in the intertestamental period because he was just an old curmudgeon in the Old Testament who just wanted to zap people and then Jesus comes who's sweet and light. No, God is joyful even in the Old Testament. 
And so here we have a God who is rejoicing over us. Here we have a God who at the sight of you when you wake up, before you've brushed your teeth, before you've figured out your hair, who sees you and he burst out in song. We have a God who when he, he sees you coming, he starts to sing arias of affirmation because he is glad that you are alive. This is the God that the Bible tells us about. And in fact, C.S. Lewis quips that joy is the serious business of heaven. Now, pick that pin back up because I'm still concerned about Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, that he is joyful in the midst of such cruel humiliation on the cross. First Peter chapter 1 verse 10 tells us that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, which means a few things for me. Walk through this thought process with me. If Jesus Christ knew before he came that he was going to be crucified on a Roman cross, that he was going to die for us, if Jesus Christ knew he was going to bear the cross, then that n means in advance he knew how difficult the journey would be. He didn't start this difficult journey simply for the joy of returning home to something he already had. The cross is not divine masochism. He is not enduring pain for the sake of pain. Nobody does that. Conor McGregor did not fight Mayweather simply because he liked to be punched in the face for 12 rounds, then finish and have the joy of Mayweather not punching him. McGregor had a hundred million dollar reason why he got in that ring. So why is Jesus on the cross, and why is it joyful for him? And as I read the Bible, it seems to me the reason he entered into such a social exchange, a covenant, if you will, that leads to his murder and execution on a cross the reason he went to the cross is because he would end up with something more valuable than he had, and that something is us. Jesus was willing to endure the cross, not for himself, but for you and for me, for us, for Walla Walla, for faculty, for staff, for students, for community members, for all of us for the boomers, for the millennials. He endured the cross, and the reason is you. We are the prize he so eagerly wanted that he went to the cross and endured it because he knew it was the only way we could be with him and the Father in eternity. We are the treasures that Christ sought for and fought for to his dying breath. And his life is not complete without him. In fact, it seems to me that on the cross, joy rooted in love for us, for you, anesthetized the, the pain that we caused and allowed Christ to hold on to us, to look through the cross and to say, this is worth it because of you. And some of you may be thinking, well, you know, this all sounds well and good, but you don't know me. I'm excellent at pretending. And there is no way Jesus Christ endured the cross for me. Maybe there's some other people, but I am sure I'm part of the terms and conditions that said for all of Walla Walla except for this person. And that person is me. And so you go through the recrimination of the things that you have done wrong, of the decisions that you have made, of the lives that you have injured, and you say there is no way Christ found any joy in being on the cross based on what I have been doing. Do you know what I was doing last night? Do you have any idea 
of what you would find if you look through my browser history and you found yourself looking at www.thisisnotanadventistwebsite.com, Jesus Christ did not go to the cross for me. I've done too much. I've gone too far. He didn't do it for me, and yet the Bible tells us that he did. He looked through the cross, and the joy set before him was you with all that you have, with all, you don't, with all that you do not have, with all of the wounds and the injuries that you have gone through in your life. It was you. And Ellen White, speaking about this, says the joy that was set before Jesus was that of seeing souls redeemed by the sacrifice of his glory. His honor, his riches, his own life, the salvation of man was his joy. The salvation of Walla Walla was his joy. The salvation of those in the girls' dorm and in the boys' dorm was his joy. The salvation of our staff and faculty members was his joy. The salvation of the pastoral staff was his joy. When all the redeemed shall be gathered into the kingdom of God, he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. This morning it means if you are sitting here, regardless of what father wounds or mother wounds, regardless of what dysfunction you may have come out of because of your family history, regardless of the addictions that you may be battling, the demons that keep you up at night. Jesus Christ sees you, and this is how he views you. He summons you to believe that you are the source of his joy. You sit here not just as flesh and bones, but as a repository of the joy of the divine. You sit here as the person that God looked at and said, even if it was just you, it would have been enough for me to stay there. And if this is true, friends, it means that we need to start using different yardsticks by which we measure ourselves. If we are truly the repositories of God's joy, we can no longer allow society to dictate how we are measuring ourselves. We can no longer allow what Madison Avenue says to dictate who we are. We must be able to recognize that our waist size or our bank balance or our familial prestige or our race or our sexuality or our GPA or our nationality cannot be the primary identifier that we carry, but rather it must be that all of us, flesh and blood, actually are the repositories of the joy of God. We are ambassadors of God's joy, of this Easter joy that comes because Christ stayed on that cross and then conquered the grave with you in mind. And so I think this morning for my five-year-old and for the kids who are here, what this might mean for you in the week to come to recognize that you are a repository of the joy of God, that you are beloved and claimed by Jesus. And I think that being given this calling means that some kids who love to draw cats, you know, there are some kids who just draw cats, never dogs, just cats. Some just draw dogs, never cats. Some draw things that come out of their imagination. Hey, when you draw your picture of a cat or a dog, you can write the word joy on the bottom. You can give it to someone. You can remind them that God is joyful for them and for their life. For some of us, as we recognize that we are repositories of joy, we also recognize that we do not live in silos and there are other people. And so it means to have cruciform joy means we have to look at other people and say, what? And I just thought you were my English teacher. But you are really a repository of the joy of God. This changes everything. And so the way in which you speak and you treat people needs to begin to change. It means that the tone of your emails don't need to be as acerbic and harsh as they have been because you're just doing business. Because you recognize that the people that receive the email are 
the people that caused the joy of God, right? It means that when you go to Walmart and the person is bagging your groceries, that you make eye contact and you engage in a conversation with them when they talk, even if they are earning minimum wage, they are not minimum value to God. It means they are also a repository of the joy of God. And he was on that cross and said, if it was this individual, I would have been there for them. It also means, this was not in first serve. Let's see how this one goes. It also means, Walla Walla, that for those of us who live in this polarized nation at this point, or oh, someone's smiling at the front, they, they know where I'm going with this. It means no matter how you feel about the gentleman at the White House, that Christ on the cross saw him as being worthy and, as, and of having joy to enter through the cross for. I'll just leave it right there. Figure the rest out. Because the joy of God does challenge us. Okay, now for the rest of you who may not be thinking outside of yourself, Understanding that you are a repository of the joy of God means that you need to start doing some work with your negative self-talk when you look in the mirror. It means the way that you have viewed yourself needs to change. It means you are more than your social security number. It means you are more than the sum of your mistakes and your worst, your worst moments. You need to look in the mirror, understanding that Christ went to the cross, raised triumphant from the grave, and the first face in his mind was yours. And you need to reframe how God sees you, even if other people do not see you the same. Because there is a biblical insistence that you are the source of divine joy. And I think to myself, what difference would it make if we valued and delighted in each other, recognizing that each of us bear this stamp of bringing joy to God as we give our lives to him. Matthew 28 and verse 8 says this, speaking about the, the ladies who, who saw Jesus Christ after he was risen. It says, they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and with great joy, and ran to bring his disciples' word. And I think that it's such a fitting conclusion for us as we think about the joy God has given to us, that if we are the repositories of God's joy, that like those women at the tomb, we recognize that we are now living in resurrection time, and even if we are afraid of the implications for who we have to love or the tone of our emails or how we have to start thinking about ourselves, we can say we have moved from death to life, that Jesus Christ has conquered, that we are objects of his love, of his joy and his affection. And like the women, we can start running and we can go back to our families we can go back to the places we work. We can go back to the places that we shop. And we can say there is a difference because I and you are made in God's image and we are repositories of his joy. Wouldn't it be incredible if when people said, hey, Walla Walla, and then they said college place, they didn't say, yeah, I think uh, there's a bunch of seventh day some, something, that they're over there. Yeah, those people. What do you know about them? Well, I... I think they're vegetarians. Uh, I'm not quite sure what else they do. Do you like my Walla Walla accent? Okay, it's not. Uh, but in fact, they would say this is a group of people who are marked by joy. If you go there, they will smile, smile at you if you're on campus. If you walk down College Avenue, people are going to wave. If you ask for help, you are going to get it. And the implications of recognizing that me, that you, that all of those who live in our community, whether they, are, uh, they have papers or they do not have papers, whether they look like you or don't look like you, bear the stamp of God. 
and God joys over them and sings over them and has pride over them? What would that look like in Walla Walla were we to live a life like that? And I pray, <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> You know, we come, we preach, we sing, and we do it all for this purpose, to live cruciform lives, to recognize that joy has come and that joy compels us to live different lives. So in the week to come, may you live a life marked by joy, knowing that you are the repository of God's joy.
Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn his face toward you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lifts up the light of his countenance and give you peace now and forever. Amen. of brief announcements, please be seated. Our elder, Mel Lang, would love to pray with you, whether it's to celebrate something amazing or something that you are really wrestling with and would love to have somebody pray with you. Mel will meet you here on the organ side of the sanctuary. Tomorrow morning, we love an early morning, don't we? when it means we get to celebrate Jesus Christ together. So we invite you at 6 a.m. to Mount Hope, where we will honor the resurrected Savior and discuss what it means to have a live and wonderful Savior. So we invite you there at 6 a.m. We will have a light breakfast that we will serve. This afternoon in Hubeck Chapel at 3.30, the Adventist Forum is hosting a meeting on the problem of headship theology. We would love for you all to be there after lunch. 3.30 in the chapel this afternoon, the problem with headship theology. And finally, on Monday, we did not make this into the bulletin, we apologize, but there will be a blood drive. I see a number of you who have blood pumping through your veins. We would like some of it. So from 10 to 3 in the fellowship hall on Monday, you could save a life. May God bless you and keep you. And before we dismiss, I want to remind you that it's our custom here at the University Church to treat the postlude as a continuation of our service, and we invite you to worship with us. And if you'd like to exit, you can do so quietly as you are dismissed by the deacons. <laughs> Thank you.
Friends, thank you again for joining us this Sabbath. We would love to hear how this ministry impacts you and where you are joining us from. Send your emails to church at wallawalla.edu.